when you do really have those authentic friendships, it's just a whole different feeling inside when you're with that person than someone that's surface level. And it does take us being vulnerable and um, being able to be ourselves. Illuminance specializes in developing sensory processing sensitivity, a natural high sensory intelligence present in 30% of the population, co-creating with the power of humanity to consciously evolve towards balance. This session features trained high sensory coaches, facilitators and consultants who coach other high sensory people and partner with organizations globally. To contact them directly or to find out about our programs, please see the details in the description. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacy, and I also have Bonnie here with me. We have an amazing topic today for HSPs, and we're going to talk about toxic friendships, how we stay away from those, and how do we gain positive friendships instead. And as HSPs, often this can be a challenge for us. And so a few of the things that are just sort of unsafe friendships for HSPs, if you will, and we'll talk more about them, but things like shallow friendships, um, judgmental friendships, friendships that are like really demanding of our energy in a more negative way, and then anything that's really draining to us. And there's so many things that can be triggering for that. So those are a few of the things that just come to mind right off the top. Oh, those are great, uh, great guidelines and and boundaries, really. What it makes me think of, Stacy, is I had a really good friend and there was a give and take because I think many times in friendships there are, but knowing how we're empathic and compassionate, many times we get into relationships that it isn't balanced. So I had a friend who had a traumatic childhood. We had so many things we enjoyed together. Um, she was supportive in... Um, certain ways to me, but as time went on, um, more trauma, uh, significant others, hers had died, um, just she had physical issues. And so this is, again, sometimes where text or emails can um, be misinterpreted. Um, she had mentioned something about her daughter. And when I responded back, she misinterpreted what I had said and became quite angry and, and also had said to me, um, you just want to come stay at my house. Well, I wasn't going to stay at her house. So what I realized in this relationship was when I, and I processed it myself. And I think that that's part of the important piece or to, or to talk with someone or to talk to a therapist about it. What I realized in this relationship is that it wasn't balanced because it's so easy. I think sometimes either to take all the responsibility or blame somebody else or feel like the victim in a relationship. And I did, I really did. I felt so badly, but what I realized was the relationship was not balanced. I listened, I was compassionate. I was always giving, always giving. And when I needed some support, it wasn't there. And so when this happened, it was just, she was in a lot of pain. She was having a lot of challenge, but the relationship no longer served me. It became toxic. So I was very sad about it. We had been friends for 15 years, but I, I realized to let it go. I, what were you gonna say? Can, I was just going to say, I think that can definitely happen with us as HSPs because we are so empathetic that often we overgive and you're right, for a healthy relationship, it has to be both sides. Now, with that said, sometimes it's ebb and flow, of course, where like one person's going through this and then someone else is going through that at a different time. And I think that's just natural. But, you know, if you always find that you're the only one giving, it is really difficult because it's very draining for us. I think it's draining for anyone, but especially for HSPs. And I think that's the other reason that a lot of times we actually attract narcissistic relationships, which is scary, um, but it's true. And it's because we're always doing that giving, we're always, you know, and then it gets kind of taken advantage of. And so we do have to be a little bit careful about that. And actually, Beth has joined us now, too. Hi, so sorry about it. The little internet hiccup I like I'm trying to shake it off um anyway so I guess um so we're kind of going over our experience with this topic 
correct? Yeah. So I'd say my experience uh, with toxic friendships, it's kind of interesting. I feel like I'm almost at a point in my life where I'm really beginning to understand what like real close friendships are. I've had a lot of trouble in my life being really authentic with people and kind of opening up to people. So a lot of my friendships, except for a few friendships in childhood, have been very surface level. Um, So kind of when you show up in the world kind of inauthentically, it can be really hard to navigate friendships in a sense of like, I was always thinking about like, what is it that I'm offering the friendship? Like, what is it that I'm doing in this friendship that will keep this person with me? And I think kind of the thing that, which that in itself is kind of toxic as far as like, what, what can I do to like, keep this person with me instead of having like a real friendship? Um, But the way that I kind of navigated that was like, I was always a really good listener. I was always really good at being kind of an ear for people to work through their issues. And so I think where I've really struggled with friendships is I've had a tendency to find people that needed that where they didn't necessarily want to hear my issues or didn't have maybe the bandwidth to kind of hear me out when I had issues, but I was able to be there for them through a lot of listening. And so at the time it kind of felt like it was working like, okay, this is healthy. I'm building friendships, but really it was kind of me just being quiet and listening to someone and not really having that kind of back and forth. So that's been my biggest experience. I think what you're saying is so true. And I think it just underscores what Stacy says. I I know we as HSPs do attract people because we do listen. And and what you're saying is what I found in, in childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, even as a mom with my kids growing up, people always came to me because exactly what you said, we're good listeners, we're compassionate. Um, so people are drawn to us. And many times I don't think we realize that we actually deserve the same thing, to have someone listen to us with unconditional um, unconditional love in the way that we'll, we can say, hey, Beth, and, and be truthful, but not hurtful in saying it. But yet we love, we love you, Beth, anyway. We love you, Stacy. We love me, Bonnie, because that's what true friends do. There's that give and take. They accept us. But I think many times as HSPs, we don't let ourselves be seen because it hurts when people, you know, if we're in a relationship with someone who isn't careful how they speak the truth to us or share their feelings. Yeah, I think for sure. And I think sometimes too, it's us really taking a moment of reflection and trying to figure out what do I want in a friend? You know, I think often as HSPs, we want someone that has more depth to them. Like you have more meaningful conversations. You know, you want somebody that when you're around them, you feel the positive energy and you don't always feel drained and negative energy. So kind of trying to make sure we're listening to our bodies about that. But really looking at that because I think we also can have a negative friendship when we almost overshare and they're not that kind of person. They're not, you know, a deeper person. And so we almost scare them away. So it's sort of (laughs) like fine line of kind of reading, you know, what do I really want in a friend? And then as I'm meeting people, how do I assess that? You know, trying to be careful about how I'm assessing that and and also not being afraid to put ourselves out there in new places. You know, like what are some common groups that, you know, we have an interest in this or that. And so we join this or we join that. I think sometimes we tend to hibernate instead of like really putting ourselves out in new experiences so that we can gain new friendships. And You know, honestly, for people that have positive social relationships, it affects like your well-being. It affects how long you live. It affects. So it's critically important, honestly, for us to be healthy. Yeah. Um, Stacey, you said something really interesting about like kind of 
that you can almost like scare people off or like there's that feeling that you can kind of scare people off if you like go too strong. I think like that has been something that I've kind of like noticed because I think, you know, when it comes to social situations, like I have a lot of social anxiety and really like connecting with people, having deep connections, there is an aspect of it of the fear of like, I'm not good enough. Like I'm not going to be interesting enough or cool enough. But I think really my bigger fear is that I'm going to scare people because like I have like, you know, as HSPs, like we have such big emotions. Like I, I react really strongly to things like both positive and negative. And I think that like, there is a big part of me that's like, I don't make deep connections kind of with deep people because I'm like afraid that I'm going to scare them away with like the intensity of it. So I think sometimes like I almost gravitate toward people that maybe like don't have those, you know, like maybe don't feel as intensely, I guess, like I don't want to minimize anybody, but, um, because it feels like a little bit safer, like like I, I can breeze through and just do surface level things and not be worried about like showing myself and scaring someone away. And they're not, cause I think in the past, I almost had trouble connecting with HSPs because I know that like HSPs are looking for that deeper level connection, but I was still afraid to like show myself because I was afraid that like those emotions would scare someone away. So I think it, I kind of gravitated towards more, you know, people that were okay with shallow re- relationships. Yeah, I think it's easy for us to do that as HSPs, but it doesn't like feed us. It doesn't feed our soul when we're doing that. And I think when you do really have those authentic friendships, it's just a whole different feeling inside when you're with that person than someone that's surface level. And it does take us being vulnerable and um, being able to be ourselves. I think as we're kind of assessing new friendships, we can work into that gradually to see if they are that kind of person or they're not that kind of person. And even just with simple things, instead of like asking, you know, how are you, you You know, you can say something like, how do you feel today? You know, just even something that's like a small hint um, to see what their answer is, you know, and to kind of get a sense as you start to get to know someone, you know, Do they think about deeper topics? Do they not? And just introduce things very gradually to them. Um, And then once you feel safe, I mean, we, I feel like we need to kind of have a safe environment to really reveal, you know, like, oh, have you ever heard of this? Or just so you know, sometimes I overreact and here's how, you know, and, and making sure that we're clear that, you know, sometimes we might misunderstand each other and we don't want that. So how can we be open about that and also hold each other accountable about that and not, you know, let the other person just go off one direction? I think we've all felt that way, Beth. And um, Stacy. I think that's such good um, advice to sort of test the waters. But as I'm listening and thinking about, you know, some of my journey and Beth listening to you, some of it, too, is about just us being OK with who we are. And then I, I like what Stacy said, because I'm looking at, you know, my friendships in the past, but even now, um, I had a really painful year with my daughter. It was really painful, nothing I had experienced before. And I knew my friends that would really get, because talk about emotional <laughs> and um, over the top. But then, you know, one of my friends who probably does not get me deeply, um, and they're a couple friend. But yet it was good to get her sort of balance, which was more superficial yet supportive. So I think it's as we started this topic, finding those friends that are supportive, that it's a healthier relationship so we can be ourselves and know who can I go really deep with and who can I be myself, but I'm not going to talk about, you know, maybe I'm not going to talk about that particular incident with them because they wouldn't understand that. And I, I myself like a variety in so many ways. So if all my friends were HSPs, it'd probably be boring. (laughs) And I love the deepness and I do appreciate having those conversations. Um, But I think it's just as we navigate life, we start to navigate those people who we are around and and we deserve to be who we are and be accepted Um, and not be in a relationship where we're not, especially when it's a choice of a friend. 
family, a little harder to navigate sometimes. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah. I do like that idea of having, you know, like in a a variety of friends, because I definitely have. So I like to craft a lot. I really like to make things and figure out how to make things. Um, And I have, you know, some friends who are very, very high energy people that like love to make things and, you know, figure like, I love to make costumes. I love to, I'm learning carpentry very like slowly. Um, so I, uh, loved talking to them because like, we can just talk about like figuring out how to do things like, and it doesn't really like all it involves is really just like excitement and like interest. And it's like, it is, it's calming in a weird way. Like it's exciting, but it's also calming. Cause it's like, Oh, all we're talking about is like, my workshop setup, like that's all we're talking about. And it's, it's really lovely. Yeah. I mean, I think that what we're all kind of saying is our friends don't all have to be HSPs. I mean, it's sort of, what is that variety so that you do have those friends that you can have more in-depth conversations, but you also have friends that are more on the lighter side of things at times. And Um, often, you know, they can lift you up a lot as well. And I think really just looking at the friendships and, you know, you're not going to fill one need often, you know, or all of your needs with one friend. And that's why we have multiple friends, you know, like you kind of get this from this person and this from this person. And, you know, I think the hardest thing we do is sometimes letting friendships go, but sometimes that's appropriate also, you know, sometimes, you've outgrown that friend or they've outgrown you or, you know, whatever it might be and being able to gradually let something like that go when we, when we need to. Um, And I'm not saying we always do, but just making sure we're really listening to ourselves. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just giggling because I I remember at one point um, that when I got married and after being married for a while, I remember thinking it'd be so nice to have another husband. You know, let me have two. <laughs> what you say, like, not one person that saw your knees. And I, it just made me laugh. But it's it's so true it's and really funny <laughs> that yeah, not one person is going to fill all our needs, and nor do we fill another friend's needs. And I think going back to Stacey, what you were talking about to begin with, it's really about the health of the relationship. And so the healthier we are within ourselves and recognize the healthier we're going to attract healthier relationships and being very careful. You mentioned it, Stacey, and I think it's really important with the um, narcissistic, severely codependent relationships. You know, it's our responsibility to look at ourselves, I believe, and then say, okay, where am I contributing? How did I attract this? Not fault but just how can I become healthier? How can I have healthier relationships? Do like Stacy said, do I need to let this relationship go? Because I think sometimes we get so entangled, we don't know how to get out. And then there's so much guilt. And we, of course, put that on ourselves. Um, and then fear, of course. So having that support when we're navigating really toxic, challenging relationships, not trying to do it on our own. Um, we're not here to walk by ourselves and to, to navigate a very challenging, toxic relationship. It's important to have support. It is. I think it's important to set boundaries also, you know, and there's some times where it's just like, this is what it is, you know, and it's hard and difficult, but in the end, it's much healthier for us once we do that. And then that person can choose to stay or walk away, but they kind of know this is, this is my limit, (laughs) like, like no further. And it's hard as HSPs, I feel like to stick to our boundaries, but once you actually set them, it's really important that we do. And sometimes yeah. it helps just to have somebody you're accountable to that says, all right, I'm setting this boundary because it's easy for us you know, to go out of our way or to think we're the ones who failed or to feel sorry or compassionate for the other person. Yeah, it's not quite uh, the same because this wasn't really a relationship uh, or a uh, friendship relationship, but we have a coach house in our backyard that we rent out. um, And we had a renter over the past couple of years who 
I don't like blame her because I don't think she, she wasn't a bad person, but she had a lot of fear and a lot of a lot on her plate. Um, and she really kind of leaned on us a lot more than she should, like in an extreme ways. And if we didn't comply, she would respond with anger. And it was very stressful having her here. Um, but she moved out. And even after she moved out for months, she would call me and say, hey, I think I might have mail. Can you check the mailbox and I'll come pick it up? And it felt similarly because I had to, it was a really difficult boundary to set because I know she has a lot on her plate and she's stressed out. But at the same time, it was like four months later and I'm still checking the mailbox for her mail <laughs> and that she's moved out. And it's just like, it, it, it was so hard to like set those boundaries because what was going in through my head was just like, well, she's in an extreme situation. She's stressed out. Like she is going through all of this. Like it's not that much of my time to go check the mail and text her a picture. Like it's not that bad, but like, it felt like I had, like, it sounds terrible, but it felt like I had like a leech stuck to my arm that was just draining that little bit of energy from me. And like, I finally realized it. And it was just, it was so difficult to like, tell her no. But the way I framed it in my mind is like, the way that I'm trying to frame it is that I'm almost giving her a gift. Like she was leaning on me instead of learning how to be able to take care of herself. And I think sometimes in toxic friendships where someone's kind of leaning too heavily on you and draining you constantly, like it can almost be a gift to say like, Hey, maybe it's time. Like you can kind of learn how to handle some of these things for yourself. Like as an adult, like I'm kind of trying to think of it more as a gift that I'm giving them, like their autonomy as an adult, uh, instead of worrying that I'm hurting them somehow. Um, so that's what I've been working on. <laughs> that's tremendously insightful. I mean, I think that's, and Stacy was nodding too. That's so important what you just said is that when we're doing it for them, it's not allowing them to do it for themselves. So they're not going to change their behavior. If we think about codependence, if we're taking responsibility, it doesn't allow the other person. And then who who suffers? You know, it was draining. I, I loved your analogy. It was, it was like sucking the energy out of you. Um but that idea of the gift, it's a gift for them and a gift for you. That's that's amazing insight, Beth. Thanks. It definitely <laughs> is. Well, I think our time is coming to an end. So as we wrap up, we're going to each just introduce ourselves so you can learn a little bit more about each of us and what we do. Um, I'm Stacy Ingram. My company is Cultivating Your Courage. I am located in Colorado and I work with youth athletes and performers. And if you think about it, just like you practice to get mental muscle physically, you need to do the same thing mentally. And so I help kids with confidence, um, focus, you know, pressure moments, how to have true peak performance and many other things, but it just gives you an idea. And then um, how about you, Bonnie? Oh, Stacy, I'm so excited with what you're doing. What a gift to these athletes. That's really awesome. Uh, my name is Bonnie Snyder. My website is Diamond Pathways. I'm an intuitive uh, life balance coach. I work with highly sensitive women um, to really partner with um, those sabotaging voices, limiting voices that we have, and about being highly sensitive and to embrace them as the superpowers that they are. And it, it's just exciting as we, we claim ourselves and come home to ourselves to see what we can do and feel confident within ourselves. And that's what gives me energy and passion. And how about you, Beth? Um, hi, I'm Beth Hansen. So I am an HSP and I'm currently training to become a life coach. Um, I'm not sure exactly what area I'm going to focus on yet, but likely something to do with creativity. So I will keep everyone posted <laughs> on how that's going. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, so many HSPs are creative in one way or another, and uh, it's a great avenue to be looking at. So I love that space too. Yeah. Well, 
I'm going to wrap us all up here and thanks everybody. So we will see you next time. <laughs>